Thanks again to all the sponsors. Thanks to all of you for coming out. Hi! My name is Ryan J. Downey. I am with Alternative Press for many, many years now. Thank you for coming out to the MI Conversation Series. John Feldman and Andy Beersack. Look at this. Can we just get an extra round of applause for John Feldman's suit? Are we gonna hold hands the whole time? Do it. It'll be really weird. People like all photos and stuff. Because right now we think it's funny, but in like a year when people are looking at photos and the two of us are holding hands the whole time, <laughs> without any context, just like this in all photos. Los just... Angeles! <laughs> Woo! Uh, as, okay, so you guys know Andy. John Feldman. Um, we just had Good Charlotte here uh, not that long ago. Uh, we had Sleeping with Sirens here not that long ago. Um, I've been constructing something. I don't think he knows this yet. I've said this in interviews to probably every one of his bands at this point. But, you know, we have the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? Where all the Marvel superheroes participate in this shared world. Uh, there's something I've, I've defined as the Feldiverse, which is the universe of bands that exist in the alternative press realm that share a connection with this guy. This guy has made, like, all of our favorite records. Mm. So... Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, and uh, I always, I, I've been saying this at every one of these for the last three or four, and I have to quote my friend Dave Peters of the band Throwdown, because this is his quote. Never trust anyone in the music industry who didn't try to start a band first. And Mr. Feldman is also a musician. I am, yes. Um, they know. Thank you. So, how did you two first meet? Grinder. No, no, right, no. Wasn't it? Wasn't that what? Not, yeah. not, well, not how did you and I first meet, the two of you. Uh, the way that we first met was, I don't know if John remembers the way that we first met. You were working on the drugs record. Um, with uh, Matt Good was living with me at the time, and I went to your old place, wherever that was. That's uh, drugs the band, not just every record Feldman does. <laughs> no, he was, yeah. uh, you were working on the drugs record, and I came over to your place. And uh, I met you that way, and then I, I we kind of had social meeting. But let's talk. What about the the first time that you came to a Black Veil Brides show? The first time I remember meeting you was at the Whiskey Black Veil Brides. This must have been what, like seven, six years ago? How like long? Two thousand nine or something. Okay, right. And I was just uh, I forget. I was just one, one, some band I was working with was supporting you. Get scared. Get scared. Was supporting you, and I was on the balcony waiting. And like it, from what I remember, there was like three massive security guards, like two, 250 pound security guards, and they like, push me out of the way, and they're like, Andy Beersack is about to go down the stairs. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, who the fuck is Andy Beersack, A, and, and B, like, dude, stop eating so much, like, really? And uh, that was my first experience, meeting you, my friend. It wasn't even a meet, I saw it, but you, you had like, yeah, yeah, it was it was awesome. You had like a trench coat with your you had this massive collar flipped up, and you walked down. It's like you had a cape on. You like floated down the stairs. I'm like, I, I think Feldy's mixing up uh, the Batman films. No, with it was that Andy was for the first that time. was never owned a trench coat. It was a cape. Well, yeah, I did wear a track. Yes, cape it was a cape. You wore it, whatever, and it was like this guy's awesome. I, What's I, funny I, about that story is that I did not have security guards, certainly. So maybe those guys were just like really impassioned. <laughs> I think they were volunteers. Yeah, they were impassioned large fans. Some dude who's just eating and just like pushed me out. Okay, what? whatever. Was he eating while he was telling no, you this? No, uh, that's what I remember. That's what I remember. That's very of, unprofessional. Of seeing you for the first time. I don't remember seeing you, and I feel I've apologized for this many, many times over the years. No, uh, you I have never like, apologized. Can you forgive me in this no, moment? No, I cannot. Let's make this an open. But I wanted to do want to say that I saw I, when I saw you walk when I saw you walk on stage. I go, that guy is a star. That guy right there is a superstar for sure. Thank you. Well, I, I think that um, it was a few years then after that until we, we saw each other uh, again. Uh, we were working on, um, I'll just, if you don't mind, I can kind of tell the, the backstory of Please. how we wound up making Russian Divine and all, and all that kind of stuff quickly. Um, 
we, uh, Black Veil Brides, uh, we were making a record um, as a follow-up to Set the World on Fire, and we were making it with a producer in the L.A. area who, um, uh, it, things weren't syncing immediately uh, with the band and, and him, and it wasn't anything, there was nothing wrong with his process, it just it was, it wasn't working out for us in the best way. Um, and so I had met John, and we'd worked together, I think we wrote We Don't Belong Here, um, yeah. Uh, early on, and uh, we had clicked immediately and had such a good uh, chemistry that I walked out. I remember I walked into the studio one day, and uh, the guys, I think CeCe was tracking drums, and I walked in, and I looked at the situation, and I kind of assessed that we were not happy with the producer we were working with, and I walked out to the street and called John and said, can we do the record with you? And then we okayed it there, and then I walked back in and asked the producer if he would walk back outside with me, and then we sat out on the pavement and I, I I had to fire this guy <laughs> sitting next to me. So I had to come up with the excuse of like, well, it's not you, it's it's us, man, it's not. And that was very sad, but then I didn't, it didn't bother me because the next day I was with Feldy and, and everything was better because, uh, I mean, as you guys know, uh, Wretched Divine is a very ambitious thing that we, we were trying to do and I don't think we ever could have done that without Feldy. The concept record would have never come together without feeling the comfort that John gives you as an artist. And I think any of the artists that you guys know who've worked with John always speak emphatically about how comfortable he makes you and how free you feel uh, to explore and do different things and how much his ability to write songs and to know what's a great song will help you in, in terms of your decision making when it comes to what the record's gonna sound like or what the record's gonna be. So putting together a concept record would have never happened if it wasn't for John and we kind of just went in uh, head first, and, and we didn't have a long time to make it, but it, it felt like, you know, it felt perfect. Yeah, um, I just want to say how uncomfortable this this goddamn shirt is that, that you've made me wear. Speaking of how comfortable I make you and how, anyway, that We Don't Belong was the first song I remember talking about the idea. Like, when I grew up in the 80s, like, you, ha you really had to pick sides when it came to music. Like, for me, it was... It was really like Black Flag, Social Distortion, or Styx, REO, Speedwagon. Like you couldn't, you couldn't cross over like you can kind of cross over now with, you know, um, whatever, Justin Bieber and the Cradle of Filth. What, I mean, it's like whatever, it is music. I have, I have Shaka. both in yeah, my exactly. phone right you, now. Yeah, exactly. There's this crossover. It doesn't even... Cradle like, of Bieber. Yeah. <laughs> And we were just talking about like grow, you know, growing up with music as, as the culture of, of our lives being everything that, uh, encompassing our, our bodies and just the music that we grew up on was very similar. And you growing up in a very different you know, area and a very different lifestyle than I grew up in the Bay, when I grew up in the Bay Area, you know, many more, many years earlier than you. And we had this, we, I, to me, we had an instant bond of sharing love for punk rock music, especially 70s punk rock music. And the song, We Don't Belong Here, it ca just came out so quickly and it was so painless, you know. The thing is, though, when I think about making Wretched and Divine, Andy had like, he had such a clear vision. And one of the reasons that I think that like we've had such a great, like Andy's been so successful, he's always, he's a vision when it comes to lyrics, when it comes to melodies, and when it comes to what al kind of album you want to make. You've always got a very defined, and you wanted to make this record. You had a movie already planned. You had, uh, you had drawings that you have drawn about like what the movie was going to look like before we even started writing a song. So for me, it was just like putting the pieces together was so was so easy. But I do remember the first couple sessions we did, I think there was a producer you had worked with prior that said, if you drink whiskey... At 3 a.m., you get the, like a way better vocal performance, and I'm like, I'm like an up at six with my kids drinking like 30 espressos a day, very opposite of that style of recording. And really quickly, like I, I realized that your voice was much better when you removed the whiskey. Your attitude was also better, and you kept your clothes on also <laughs> when you removed the whiskey from the situation. We found that out on the Andy Black record that I sing much better when I'm not drunk. So. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, well, I'll, I'll give you the backstory on that real quick. The, uh, we made our second record with a producer who was a very nice guy. I met him a few times, uh, and that is to say he was mostly not there during the process of making the record, so we were kind of left to our own devices and being shitheads that were trying our best to live the rock and roll dream or whatever we thought that was, the requirement to be fucked up all the time was there. And that's, I don't advocate that because you make some very poor decisions. You could see images of how we dressed back in those days to maybe uh, <laughs> see an example of potentially some of the cod pieces and whatnot. Um, you know, uh, but uh, 
th that time was very much full of like you know we were trying to live the debauchery and stuff that we had seen and all the behind the musics and all the things that we loved about you read Hollywood. Motley Crue the Dirt and you were sure like, but the I, thing I is can we top you know, that. when we were legitimately poor and living right down the street in Little Armenia in a shit ass one room apartment and and we wanted to kind of live that thing so when a producer comes in and tells someone who's 19 years old and wants to be that thing you sound better when you're fucked up that was all I needed to hear I was like for the rest of my life I will be drunk. <laughs> All the time. And so uh, going into working with Feldy, that was this thing. And then it, it was, I had moved past it in my life and I had grown up and that wasn't something I was doing all the time, but I still had this weird element in my brain that was like, oh, I have to drink at least uh, a, you know, a hot whiskey or something while we're recording. Or I had this weird thing that I had to have some sort of booze in my system. And uh, fortunately we discovered that that is not true and I actually sing better not drunk. So don't get drunk, everybody. Sound better. This message brought to you by Earth Crisis. Yeah. <laughs>